Well, joining me on the Godcast today is Jarrell Robinson Brown. Now, Jarrell is a British-born uh, Jamaican and grew up in West London, where his el- with his elder sister, where he was raised by his grandmother. And uh, sensing an early call to ordain ministry, Jarrell began preaching in the Ealing Trinity Circuit of the Methodist Church, and he later trained for ordination at Wesley House, Cambridge. Um, Gerald in 2020 became an Anglican and having served in the parish of Putney, uh, which is where Inclusive Church began, um, Gerald is now serving as an Associate Chaplain at King's College London. I hope that's all right and correct, Gerald. How are you today? Good, thank you. Good, thank you. I finished at King's last month, but that's fine. I'm I'm waiting now to um, begin QSC eventually. Okay. Perfect. I'm doing really well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. It's wonderful. So whereabouts are you? You're in London now, are you? I am, yeah, I'm living in um, Kilburn at the moment, so um, I'll be here until about July. Okay, is, is that a good place to live, Kilburn? Yeah, it's been, it's different to Putney, <laughs> not quite the same, um, but it's nice to be kind of back on the side of the river that, that I know and I was born on, um, so it's nice to kind of, to be somewhere familiar, and I'm enjoying it a lot, actually. Yeah. Gerald, before we get down into the, the really meaty questions, I'm interested to know, um, kind of, uh, you, you're leaving the Methodist Church. What what prompted that? It's so funny because I think often, um, you know, when we when we think back to the lives of of great people um, like the saints, we often look for a really clear narrative when it comes to, you know, vocational um, shifts. And I think the same happens with with box standard people around today that we want a kind of really clear narrative. Um, and I often frustrate people by saying, actually, I can I can look at a series of kind of events. Um, I'm happy to talk about those, but equally, there's a sense in which it's also honest to say that I don't really know kind of what 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 that's about completely. Um, so in terms of the events, for me, Methodism is itinerant ministry, so you, you generally move around every five years. So that's that's the kind of bog standard Methodist um, appointment when it comes to ordination that you you are itinerant and you move around. So you don't stay in one place, um, not like the Church of England at all. And you don't apply for jobs, you're just appointed. Um, and the circuit that you're going to gets a chance to meet you and you get a chance to meet them. But the idea is really that both sides say yes, unless there's a really big reason for saying no. Um, so you're under discipline to go. So I was sent from Cambridge to Cardiff, um, kind of just directly, that was it, you were going to Wales. I went to Wales for five years, had two Methodist churches there um, from 2013 to 2018. Great place, um, really challenging ministry in lots of ways, but a good first appointment. Um, then from Wales, I was sent back to London, to South East London, um, very different churches, two again. Um, but I went from white majority churches to black majority churches. Um, and then I woke up in these churches as an openly gay black man, um, and it was just too much for the people there. Um, and of course, I've been sent through stationing. So they've kind of had to have me and I had to go. Um, and we tried to make it work out, but it just doesn't. And I think there's something about kind of being in a, in a moment of crisis. So at the same time as that was happening, you know, being in a church where actually the people don't really want you there. Um, some wouldn't come forward for communion. Some wouldn't let me baptize their children. They wanted other clergy to do weddings and funerals. It just became unworkable. Um, and then at the same time, my grandmother died in that same period. Um, my partner and I split up all around that same time. And I think the moment of crisis made me think, you know, why am I doing this um, in this particular denomination? And I'd always been someone whose convictions around things like the Eucharist and ministry had been fairly Catholic. Um, and in Cambridge, I spent a lot of time alongside Anglicans. Um, but Methodism was... The family, the family religion from Jamaica. So I was a Methodist, I didn't know Anglicans. And I think that moment of crisis just forced me to really discern, you know, what am I doing here? And the outcome of that discernment um, was that I became an Anglican. But in between that, um, I went to Walsingham to give an organ recital because I was a musician in the previous life. Um, and it was part of the ecumenical Marian pilgrimage. And as part of the payment, um, they said you could have a free place on the pilgrimage and kind of come to what interests you and do whatever else you want to do when, when you're not part of the programme. And I went along to this um, talk by Bishop Jonathan Goodall, who's the Bishop of Epsfleet, um, and it was about Mary as the mother of the church. And I don't know what happened in that encounter, but I saw him greet Callistos Ware, who's an Orthodox um, bishop and theologian. 
And something about watching them greet each other immediately made sense of the Episcopate in a way in which it had never made sense before. Um, and I almost wanted to just walk out and leave because I was kind of bombarded with this sense of, wow, um, whatever they're a part of, I'm spectating and I wanted to be part of it. Um, so long story cut short, that was the kind of defining moment for me. And from then um, I began the process to, to leave Methodism and become an Anglican. Gary, you say that it, it got too much. Um, how did that kind of uh, resonate? What was the, what was the visual uh, evidence of that? I think it was for me just a sense of, you know, I'd always been a Methodist who had defended the Methodist position on church structure and um, our understanding of ministry. And, and I would still stand with a lot of that in terms of, I think, the, the history of the church. When it comes to things like apostolic succession, it can be very difficult to make an argument as someone who studied history in depth for what some people think that looks like. Um, and I think the Methodist structuring of the church, um, you can see in the earliest parts of the church as being as being evident. And someone like Michael Ramsey, I think, would go with that. And um, Lightfoot would also say the same in terms of how the church's history actually is. Um, but there was just a sense within myself that what I had been fighting against wasn't um, wasn't the real thing, if that makes sense. I was fighting against trying to defend a sense of my own identity as a Methodist. Yeah. Um, but that was to do with what I thought um, Catholicity was. Mm -hmm. And when I saw it in action, um, suddenly I, I think it just kind of disarmed me. But I had to be in that place of vulnerability. You know, I went to Walsingham grieving. Mm -hmm. I went to Walsingham wrestling with um, my own sense of vocation. Um, and I also went um, with the option to not to not be there because I went as a musician, not as a retreat leader or as a participant in the retreat. Mm -hmm. I was there. Um, not having to be. Um, and I think that was for me what what made that possible. Yeah. Cheryl, um, uh, what, what I like about my podcast and, and Godcast is that um, it's watched by people who don't don't come to church. And we've already got some use of words there, the, the Episcopate. And, but yeah. I'm, I'm keen to just to understand, so people can understand as well, this transition from the Methodist church to the Anglican church. Can you just explain how that process has happened for you? Yeah. So, so when I talk about the Episcopal, I'm talking about um, a church that's structured through having bishops. And in Methodism in the UK, um, bizarrely, there are no there are no bishops in the British Methodist Church. There are in other parts of the world, um, and of course, that's a massive um, shift in the sense in the way in which most churches are structured. So many churches have bishops, and um, the majority perhaps have bishops. And Methodism, when it broke away from the Church of England structured itself in a way which meant there were no bishops within the church, um, Methodist Church in the UK. So that was a big difference in how we identify and how we structure ourselves. So then to become an Anglican meant that I was joining a church where there were bishops um, and where I would be um, taken in to that historic link back to not just the apostles, but back to Jesus. So that's part of what that language of Episcopate means. Um, and so the process for someone like me um, was I first had, firstly had to resign for Methodist ministry, um, which was huge for me because I, you know, on one level didn't want to, never imagined I would. Um, so I had to kind of end my ministry with my former denomination um, and then begin the process of discerning whether being a priest and deacon in the Church of England was the right thing. Um, so you go to something called a candidates panel and you talk to them about why you want to do this, this change. Um, and they kind of dig into your history and your um, background and ask for references about who you are um, and about what's going on and then they make a decision um, and in my case because I started this process just before the um, pandemic I was meant to go into a curacy um, last year and not be retrained again but because I'd already started some um, postgraduate study I've been completing that before going into a curacy um, next year so I'll be ordained deacon in July and then priest in Michaelmas in September um, and now kind of yeah and, and now you're here now you're in the Church of England uh, is it a place where you feel, feel at home and welcome um in some ways yes and in some ways it's a massive culture shift I think you know it's really funny when I announced the fact that I was I was um I had become an Anglican a lot of friends kept saying things like welcome home and it sounded you know it, it didn't sit comfortably with me because actually there's a sense in which Methodism was home and is still home because it was the the church that first formed me and that gave me 
my understanding of, of God and of vocation. Um, you don't lose that overnight just because you signed a bit of paper <laughs> to say you resigned from a, a ministry. So um, I think that culture shift is felt and is big. You know, there are things about Anglican worship which are just so different to Methodist worship, particularly the kind of preaching tradition um, and bits of Methodism that you just can't replicate or find anywhere else because they're so unique to, to Methodism. And it's also, you know, the Church of England is a much bigger church and therefore it's harder to get to know people. Whereas in Methodism, you know, most of the, the clergy um, could know each other because we were a smaller denomination. Yeah. So well, there aren't many people awaiting a curacy that kind of hit the public eye like you have, and you <laughs> did. Um, <laughs> Uh, you're certainly not somebody who's afraid to kind of raise certain issues, but t tell us, tell, tell the, the audience, what, what are the things that really drive you in your ministry, in your, as you prepare for ministry in the Church of England? Sure. I think because of the kind of space that I inhabit as someone who is um, Black and part of the LGBT community, um, you know, issues of justice and equality are really important, but I don't see them, I don't see them as kind of political issues. I see them as deeply spiritual um, theological issues actually and so for me there's no disconnect between politics and faith they are part and parcel of the same thing um, and because of that it means that when I see the church acting in a way or even society acting in a way which um, denigrates or or seeks to kind of forget or diminish the image of God in people I do feel passionately about that um, and I find it very difficult to not speak out about that because I think it's it's a key part of what it means to be someone who who has a priestly ministry in the world um you know when I was ordained as a Methodist minister um I took that that sense of call very seriously and it goes back to sen this sense of change from one church to the next that one of the reasons I did become an Anglican was because um you know I meant the promises and the vows that I made at ordination and just because that didn't work its way out in one denomination for me wasn't the end of that um, and part of what it means to be a presbyter in the world a priest in the world um, is that you do speak out against issues of injustice and yeah um, you know you, you tell the truth when it's most important yeah Cheryl something that we share in common is that uh, in recent months we've both been in the Guardian um, <laughs> and you were in the public eye because of comments about uh, Captain Tom and, and whether a, a clap was appropriate or not. I'm just wondering, in hindsight now, the dust has settled on that, what your reflections were or are. Sure. Yeah. I think that um, there's been a sense for me in looking at the reaction to some of that, that showed me and highlighted for me that there was definitely something there um, which people found true because of the way in which they responded. And I think, um, you know, if you don't, if you haven't touched a nerve, people don't respond in that way. And I think that for me, there was a really clear um, sense of realizing that there was something there to be discussed at, at much greater length um, that clearly had some resonance for a lot of people. Um, you know, many of whom were not on my side at all, but for whom I think the evidence that there was a conversation to be had was just made clear by the, the volume of stuff that I received. Um, and I think for me, there's, there's you know, self-reflection on the sense of whether that, that medium <laughs> was the best one. Um, and questions around timing, but no questions for me around around that sense of highlighting something that for society and for our nation is is an ongoing issue. And I think for me, it was really interesting to see, you know, that happen. And then the Meghan and Harry interview happen, which again raised other questions for our our society at the moment around race um, and and the monarchy. And again, um, when His Royal Highness Prince Philip died, that raises again a whole other conversation within society about you know how we grieve, how we mourn, how we mark these moments in society, um, and then questions again about establishment and and what that means for people. Mm -hmm. So it's really interesting that I think those three events were not completely disconnected, and actually yeah. each of them have have proven I think that in in society at the moment we need to have these conversations and we need to have them in a way which um, helps us to hear each other. Yeah. Do you, do you think we've lost the ability to argue well, Gerald? I mean, I, I, the piece that I was involved in, I've had critics and criticism and phone calls and letters. But you, you've got quite a lot, I understand. Yeah. 
it hasn't stopped most of it, but it's still, um, still. I think for me, what what didn't help was the church's response in that sense of I think, I think it. I know I know what the diocese wanted to do, and what the church wanted to do, but I think it it had a adverse um, effect in the long run. Mm. Um, and I think one of the saddest things for me is a lot of what I received was from people who clearly think clergy should have nothing to say at all that is in any way controversial. Mm. And I find that really sad. I, I find people's people's image of the priesthood, people's image of what they think a vicar or a preacher should be, um, kind of, it's a very low image, actually. That actually, they don't think you should have anything to say about, um, you know, what's happening in society. And mm. I find that a shame. Yeah, I, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I, um, I do think that as a church, often we're at the back of the curve when we should be at the front of the curve in the argument, having the debate. So I don't usually express an opinion, but I just did. So there we are. Um, <clears throat> so so the, the criticism that you got, Gerald, um, mm. I, I guess that was pretty poor criticism. I mean, it, I mean, we, we're all, we all appreciate constructive criticism, or we should do, but, yeah. but I guess it, it, to what level did it sink? Yeah, there was not much. I mean, the, the majority of it were people who were just very peed off. And, you know, that for me, I was like, okay, fair enough. I, I can I can appreciate that. Um, but very little of what I had, there was a few, and I was able to interact with those people, um, was about, you know, actually comprehending what I had actually said, as opposed to making criticisms about what was inferred. And actually, I, and I, I really respect the people who um, were able to read exactly what I said um, and comprehend that and then critique that as opposed to those who were just annoyed that I had said anything at all. Mm -hmm. um, you know, because I think, you know, the language around cult, the language around white nationalism, um, for those who really wanted to grapple with it, you know, could. Um, but for those who just wanted to see or imagine that I had criticised um, someone and, and their fundraising efforts when I had called that person kind and generous and had great respect and admiration for him, um, I found that a shame, you know. And there was a big thing for me about the fact that um, that, that fundraising should never have been made necessary. And a real sense for me of wanting to have, you know, a, a, a reflection on that which was mournful and which was sad. And we actually called that out as being a very, a very sad image of our society, actually. You know, it was great and it was noble. And I respect massively um, that someone of, of that many years did that. And it was an inspiration in many ways. But it also says something very shocking about um, our government, you know, and about our priorities. Um, in terms of our government yeah. and I think that's to celebrate that without the conversation about what it also represents I, I think is is dangerous and is problematic yeah Th thanks Gerald for your honesty um, let's move on to something else that's rather uh, controversial and um, uh, the matter of living in love and faith which is uh, to those outside the church is a platform to try and help Anglicans understand our differences better and to see if we can um, have differences, but love and live and work together as Christians. Gerald, what is your hope for living in love and faith? Um, I, on, on some, most days, I don't know. I think I am one of those people who feels exhausted by the conversation, if I'm honest. Um, and I think that I, if, well, if I have one hope, I think it is that those who haven't had the conversation have it um, because I think I think a lot of us have had it and are tired of having it but I hope that those who genuinely haven't had it and who are genuinely quite fearful of having it have the opportunity to have it now um, and I hope that the conversation is not just about um, same-sex marriage I hope it's much broader because the church and this is something I say all the time the church doesn't have um, a gay issue the church has a body issue <laughs> You know, actually, a lot of what we're talking about is rooted in a in a kind of body phobia and in a deep disbelief in the fact that God became flesh, which and that's a whole other conversation. But I think for me, it's it's a kind of red herring to look at the the LGBT community and think that this is what this conversation is about. Actually, it's not. It's about it's about sexuality more broadly. It's about desire. It's about bodies in general and how we as a church deal with all of that stuff um, that we're not good at talking about. 
Um, and I hope the conversation gets to some of that. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm with you on that one. We'll, we'll come to that in, in a moment, Gerald. But I was just wondering what your, you know, if you had a crystal ball and you could plan the future, how you might like the church to be different in, I don't know, say 10 years now, particularly for, for gay Christians. Yeah, yeah. Um, I want the church to be more honest, I think, you know, more generally, I think. And if that if that looks like um, a church which can bless same sex marriages and, and celebrate them, then fantastic. I think that to me would be an obvious um, outcome of LLF. I would I would love to see that happen. Um, I'm the vice chair of One Body, One Faith, which is a global LGBT um, charity which seeks to empower LGBT Christians around the world. And of course, we're um, very keen to see LLF, um, you know, make some some real changes within the Church of England. But at the same time, as a as a black um, gay Christian, I'm aware that for 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 folk like myself um, who are black and LGBT plus, actually, same sex marriage is not up there as a priority. We just we want a society and a church within which we can breathe and live. <laughs> you know, actually, the priorities are are slightly different. I think. Um, and I know that most of my black LGBT plus um, friends are not going to be running to the church um, to be married within it because they've been so hurt by the church on a number of <laughs> levels, you know, and it's important, to, it's important to say that because I think um, people think that just getting to the same sex marriage thing kind of will be a marker of equality and justice. And for me, it's not, there's a lot more that needs to happen. And as a black queer Christian, I have to say that. What, what's your what's your approach and and um, to Christians who hold a, a radically different view to yours, Gerald? Who are who would just say you're you you know this is sinful? You are you are not applying God's will. You are not uh, following Scripture. I, I, you know, I mean, it's easy for me as a as what I'd like to think as an inclusive white priest. It's very easy for me to speak out how I feel, but how do, how do you deal with that? First of all, in terms of your view, but actually how to reconcile in that with your Christian brothers and sisters? Sure, sure. I think, you know, you have to make a judgment on where where that pushback comes from. And that's, in, that's different in each conversation. So there are times when, you know, from the get-go, I can see that the motivation in someone's conversation, the motivation in their engagement is is not from a place of, I genuinely have a different conviction. It's just from a place of you're wrong. And I, I don't want to have any dialogue or discourse with you. Um, and in, if I sense that, I just don't engage because I, I don't have the time, you know? Um, and at, at the age that I am now, I just feel like I have to make choices about that. And I do. Um, but when it's, when it's with someone who's genuinely struggling, and I've had that, you know, people genuinely come to me and say, I don't get how you come to this sense of being okay with your own sexuality and with people like you, I just don't get how you reconcile that with scripture. Um, but I'm happy to sit down with that person and to genuinely say um, how it is that I read certain texts and have come to understand certain texts um, in a different way to the ways in which they have understood them. And that's to do with biblical literacy, it's to do with how I understand um, those texts in the original languages, it's to do with um, my own experiences as a, as a person. Um, and, and the ways in which I've, I've come to understand God through my own wrestling with theology. Um, and sometimes those people's views change, sometimes they don't. But I find if they're generally open to the dialogue and if they respected me enough to have that dialogue as a dialogue, um, then I find that we can actually walk away sometimes, um, you know, still in communion with each other. Um, it's when people are not willing to own, you know, their true convictions and, and their, their actual feelings that I think it can be very difficult. Yeah. Um, Carol, how would you describe the culture of the church that you work, work in in the context of how you experience? Today? Yeah. Where I am now. Um, well, I'm quite lucky. So at the moment, I'm on placement at St. Mary's Primrose Hill, which is a um, fantastic church where dear Percy Dimmer was vicar at one point. Um, and they're an inclusive church. And I find that context... You know, I've seen the Church of England in chaplaincy, for example, and that's been extremely inclusive because of the, the kind of secular context that we're in. So, you know, you're in a university that is a secular environment and therefore we hold our convictions very lightly in chaplaincy. Um, now I'm in a parish context again, um, and an inclusive one, which is Anglo-Catholic, 
but a very different kind of liberal Catholic um, environment. And there they have, you know, where if you go to St. Mary's Primrose Hill, you see the Eucharist is taking place. There's incense every Sunday, investments. Um, and then if you look to the side, there are Nike boxes um, full of trainers because of the youth work that happens um, in the middle of the week. And that youth work is dealing with, you know, gun and knife crime and with um, gang violence. And outside the church, just outside the front door, there's a knife bin. Um, and all of that is happening within that one environment. And I really love that synthesis of, you know, liturgy, ritual taking place. But actually all of that is the foundation for the church's other ministry. And then in the crypt beneath us, there's a brewery um, where beer is brewed um, and that's sold. And that also finances the church's ministry. So, you know, I'm in a place where there's a real synthesis of lots of different things. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I love. Yeah, and that's the church at its best. That sounds great. It sounds great. It sounds my, definitely my cup of tea. Um, Gerald, just uh, moving on, and and um, we've we've just had this report released. You know, just to caught in more controversy uh, from lament to action, oh, yeah. uh, proposing this suite of changes to begin the change to kind of bring around a change of culture in the Church of England. It's announced forty-seven changes to be implemented. And with over 160 recommendations, which is for an institution that moves at a dreadfully slow place, uh, pace that is that is some work, isn't it? When, when you see kind of proposals like this, um, what does that do to you? Does that does that frustrate you deeply? Does it make you angry, or does it make you um, actually um, vibrant and excited about making change happen? Well, I haven't read the report yet. I know that I'm in it. Um, <laughs> I've been told that. Um, but I, I think I think my response to, to a lot of this is a kind of apathy, um, which might surprise people, but it's because it's very difficult to, to look at this report and those recommendations and then ignore the fact that there has been so many reports beforehand that has also made recommendations and many of which have not been implemented. And so the history that these reports come with um, tell a really sad, I think, story about the inability of the church to act on these things. And for me, what it what it boils down to, um, you know, I have great respect and admiration for the people involved in this work because I know I couldn't be, um, and I take my hat off to them. And I think it's very important work. And these reports are fundamental to us um, moving in the direction that we need to. But I think we need a really serious conversation about about sin and about repentance and I think you know thank God that God didn't communicate to us as human beings through reports because we would never have got the message right and I think this is the thing that um, I'm not sure any report is going to enable people to be better people and no amount of quotas or pressure to diversify um, groups and panels and committees and PCCs is really going to push us towards what we need because what we're, what we're hinting at through all these reports, even LLF and, and um, from Lament to Action, what it's pointing to is sin. It's something about the human condition that, that none of us are who we pretend to be and that actually, um, you know, we can't become who we need to be through our own strength and I think that unless unless we're willing to look at ourselves honestly and really do the hard work um, until we're moved by the fact that some people are marginalized and oppressed um, and are not included in the life of the church until that actually saddens us, no report is going to help us because actually, you know, you can have all the right faces on all the right committees and in all the right appointments, um, but unless those people's hearts are changed, nothing changes. And I think, you yeah. know, it's fine to to have more um, UK ME um, bishops and deans and all of that, but unless they have hearts for justice and are are committed to the truth, nothing changes. Mm. Actually, and you know, I've been surprised in my own struggles where my closest allies have come from. You know, sometimes they've been black, sometimes they've been LGBT plus, sometimes they haven't been. You know, sometimes they've not been Christian, sometimes they've not been Anglican, sometimes they've been you know, from completely um, incredible places that I never would have imagined. So 
we also need to be careful about how we frame what progress looks like. Yeah. You know? Um, yeah, I, I tend to agree with you. I, I um, kind of think if change is required in the church, and, we, and you said it, has, it won't come through reports, but to me, it doesn't just extend to, to colour and sexuality, but actually extends to class as well. I, I kind of think most churches I've visited are probably best described as not really representative of the parish that they serve. And I just wonder if the church is destined to be middle class and upper class institution forever. And I think until we really affect the change, the culture of the church, I, I'm not sure if we'll get there, but but I'd like to think there is. Do you think there is a genuine appetite or or or, or do you hold the view we're kind of just stuck it, uh, and it's it's just rhetoric more than action? I hold a, a very controversial view on that, which is basically that that it's the small talk, and that actually this is just to delay what we really need to do. And you know, the thing is, I get it because actually, um, you know, the work of justice and the work of equality means that we we all have to lose out to some degree. That actually, we all have to be willing to give up some of our power. You know, for the church to really become inclusive, I have to be willing, um, even as someone who's black and gay, to to lose out on what I think, you know, my future within the church might look like. Yeah. Um, and no one's going to do that voluntarily. Yeah. So, and, you, <laughs> and again, and you wouldn't want to be a you wouldn't want to be a bishop just because you were black and gay, would you? you I, I'm I would, sure. But equally, I wouldn't want to be one at all because of because of how the episcopate looks and how it functions. That for me, I would never want that power. No. Because that, that fundamentally for me is part of the problem that actually we can never be an anti-racist church or, or a church which has dealt with its class issues or its gender issues um, until we look at how power and authority are, are held and handled. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I think there were models, there were probably better models of, of how the episcopate could, could work. You know, what, what a bishop could look like. Um, you know, I would never want that power over people. You know, um, yeah, and that's why. I think, yeah, yes. yeah, I agree. I think uh, you know our leadership structures are are. Well, somebody who worked in this in the secular world for a long period of time. You know, I I, I, I don't have a, an issue with bishops per se, but the structure of how it works is quite bizarre, really, isn't it? Right. Yeah. Um, I would like the diocese to be able to say who they want. You know, to go back to the kind of old-fashioned thing of you know the. If they don't think a candidate is worthy, then the people in the cathedral don't say anything. You know, they wait until um, they're given the candidate that they think, you know, um, God God wants them to have. And at the moment, the the way we we appoint people, we just don't have any say. The people don't have any say, which I think is just not how I work. Do you think uh, Do you think it goes back to almost the initial point we were saying about the ability to argue? Well, sometimes we just don't know how to argue and we and we faff around don't we around the edges because we don't want to upset people but then we upset people because we haven't been straight and honest with them it's a bit of um it's a bit of a perpetual cycle isn't it yeah um let's 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 as we come towards the end jarrah let's have a bit more of an optimistic and positive uh spin on the church of england what what do you you know since you've been in the church what things do you really enjoy about being in the church I think one of the positives, um, having having been in one church before and now um, being in the Church of England, is that, you know, at least in the Church of England, people do argue, and it might not be well, but people do. And I think, you know, in Methodism, um, we never we never argued because it was too small to. You couldn't really fall out with each other because you couldn't afford to, you know. Um, and actually, it, it does mean that none of us are under the illusion in the Church of England that things are working, you know. And actually, you can look at that and say, well. People often talk about Anglican Twitter and how terrible it is. And yes, there are days when I just think this is appalling and it is just, you know, the worst. Um, but then there are other days when I think at least, at least with, we are talking honestly about where the pressure points for us are and where there is work to be done. Whereas in Methodism, I think people were kind of under the illusion that it was perfect. And then when, when people experience homophobia or um, sexism or racism, it's a kind of big shock because it's as though none of us thought that that was there. And, you know, being an itinerant church, people think that just because you can move everywhere, that means everyone's okay with having someone who's black 
or gay or disabled or women. And actually, um, you know, we're part of a church where certain parishes can accept certain people and certain parishes can't. And we, we kind of, we know that and okay, it might not be ideal, but at least there's an honesty about saying, you know, this is where we are. Um, and I do think that's a positive and it means that um, in terms of mission and evangelism, um, we can be intentional mm-hmm. about where we put people, how we use resources, which, um, you know, is no bad thing. No. No bad thing at all. And, and as you, you approach curacy, in terms of practical work, what, what kind of things do you enjoy, Gerald? What you're looking forward to getting your teeth stuck into? I think I, I miss kind of just preaching regularly and presiding regularly. I want to get back to the kind of bread and butter ministry and also just getting to know people in a particular context. Um, you know, the, the, you know, meeting up with people and um, finding out about how their life is going and getting to know the local characters in, in an area um, and being able to say, you know, I'm X, Y, Z from this church, whereas at the moment, you know, you, I don't have that. Um, and even in chaplaincy, there was none of that. So I really missed that when I was at King's because um, you inhabit a very different space. So I think just to be in a particular context and have that representative role for people um, and to get stuck in with what's happening, you know, post COVID, whatever that means or looks like, mm-hmm. um, we're going to have to reimagine what, what ministry and what church looks like to a certain degree. There'll be the same standard things in terms of the things that will never change because they're just part of what church is. But we will have to be bold in in how we engage with our communities, um, and I think it's a real opportunity to, to you know, reach out to the culture, um, and to think about what evangelism looks like. Yeah. Um, in this time. Yeah, and just a question on on vocation, Gerald. I mean, uh, I suppose up north there's a few cynics that say that God only calls uh, the London clergy to the London bubble. Uh, are you are you are you a London bubble kind of guy, or you know, do you, do you will you go where God sends you? What's your, your kind of take on that? I think you know, having come from my tournament ministry and having you know submitted to that discipline before, and um, there is a bit of me that's still in that. And I think whilst five years, which was the Methodist thing, was too short, I equally don't want to be in one place forever. Um, and and the beauty of Methodism was that it sent me to Wales, where I never would have voluntarily gone. So I've seen a different part of the UK completely um, and do have a heart for serving communities that are poorer and that are, um, you know, less well-resourced in terms of ministry because London's wonderful, but I I also think, you know, there's a lot to be gained from having the experience of served in London and taking that experience to other parts of the country because um, equally other parts of the country have something to learn from London and London has something to learn from other parts of the country. So it's not just about being comfortable. It's also about exchanging that experience um which blesses not just the clergy but also the congregation Um, yeah you know they need to hear about each other and know that fundamentally um people are not actually that different when it comes to what what we go through and what we experience and what we need from god yeah one of the one of the standard questions i get on i ask on the god cast because i'm from burnley have you have you been up north gerald how far have you been north of the Watford Gap, or <laughs> I've been up as far to as far as Durham? Okay, but, well that's good. That's good. To you know, and yeah. I love Durham very much. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and I would happily serve serve up north. Yeah, lovely. Well, if you're ever in uh, Lancashire and uh, you're passing anywhere near Burnley or Blackburn, then uh, give us a yeah, shout. Yeah. I'll meet you I will do. Show you some of the delights of East Lancashire. But uh, Gerald, it's been it's been really lovely. Just um, giving you an opportunity to hear your thoughts on certain matters and um, listening to you speak so eloquently. It's been wonderful. And we wish you um, our very best wishes and we send lots of prayers to you down uh, to London for the summer. And we hope it's a wonderful time and, and, and ordination is everything you expect it to be. So for, for now, Gerald, thank you for being with us on the Godcast. Thank you. God bless.